Turning Point is brought to you by PC Wealth Management of Morgan Stanley Smith Barney and the law firm of Duffy & Duffy, protecting the victims of medical error. Our special guest today is Governor David Patterson, the former governor of New York State. Governor, pleasure to have you. Thank you, Frank. It's great to be on the show. Let's talk about your early, early life. You've certainly had an interesting uh, recent life, that's for sure. What, what was it like growing up? Son of Basil Patterson. Uh, my father was former Secretary of State of New York and former Deputy Mayor to, to Mayor Koch and the Vice Chair of the National Democratic Party. And I grew up in Long Island, where we're uh, telecasting today. The way I got to Long Island is that the New York City school system didn't really promise my parents that a blind student would be educated with the rest of the students. So my mother found this district in Hempstead, Long Island. And um, that's where I went to school. That's where I grew up. And I was one of the first. I wasn't the first, but one of the first students to be mainstreamed into public education. And uh, a lot of it went right, and some of it went wrong. Um, for instance, I never learned Braille because they thought Braille would go out of existence, and clearly it has not. Wow. So I um, uh, went to uh, Hempstead High School and left uh, high school in three years. So uh, I graduated ahead of my class. So I guess I, I showed the school district that a blind student could be educated with the rest of the class. Were you blind from birth? I probably was blind from birth, but it didn't present itself until I was about nine months old. My, I think my grandmother noticed that my eyes weren't focusing, and it uh, took a while to determine what I have. What I have is known as optic atrophy, which is scar t tissue between the retina and the optic nerve, rendering me totally blind in the left eye and with the vision of about 20 over 400, uh, which is, since there's some vision, it is, uh, called legally blind in the right eye. And um, from uh, that diagnosis, uh, when I was governor, about two months after I was governor, with all the other problems I was having, I had this severe headache one night. I thought I was having an aneurysm. They kept me in the hospital all night trying to figure out what, I, what was wrong with me. And finally, they brought an ophthalmologist. And he said, uh, Governor, you have glaucoma. So now I have uh, two eye diseases. And I thought, that's all I need right now, another eye disease. Yeah, wow. <laughs> yeah, it, it can call you a lot of things. You can't call you lucky in that department, that's for sure. <laughs> no. <laughs> but it hasn't, it hasn't stopped you. It hasn't held you back. I mean, that's a, it, you have an amazing story. Uh, not only were you the first African-American governor of the state of New York, and by the way, a very diverse state, for those who don't know, I mean, we have, uh, you know, everywhere from farmland to New York City to the island to the Hamptons, a uh, very diverse state. And it's surprising that, uh, that in a state this diverse, it took until uh, the turn of the century or beyond the turn of the century uh, for an African-American governor to be elected. Yeah, my father had run for lieutenant governor in 1970, and there wouldn't be an African-American elected lieutenant governor until I was elected with... Governor Spitzer in 2006, and uh, then I was elevated to governor when he left, and so it's been uh, it's been very exciting. Um, there was someone who served 11 days at the end of someone's term who was blind and was a governor, but really in terms of really serving, I'm really uh, the first uh, uh, blind person to be governor at the same time. But more than that, uh, what I tried to do is because of those designations to represent people who didn't have a voice and perhaps br bring a new perspective to the executive branch so that it would really um, speak for all the citizens of the state. And at times feeling that uh, the voices of communities that I lived in didn't get that voice, I tried to reach out to communities I didn't know. So for instance, when I would go to upstate New York, where they always feel dealt out by the rest of the state. I told them that I will represent you because I know the feeling of being left out. So 
when there was an opportunity to appoint a United States senator, I appointed an upstater, Kirsten Gillibrand, who they mocked and ridiculed and uh, uh, derided. And uh, I notice now that nobody even wants to run against her because it won't even be a fair fight. I was going to say, they're going to they're gonna have a hard time beating her. Absolutely. Yeah, so that aside, you mentioned Governor Spitzer. Do you have a relationship with Governor Spitzer still? I mean, I don't talk to him that often, but I uh, talk to him every once in a while, and he did me uh, a high honor when I started my radio show on WOR on uh, 710. He uh, was my first guest. Yeah. And I said to him, you know, I had to have you as my first guest because you gave me both of my last two jobs, even though one, I think, was inadvertent. <laughs> well, the one that, uh, one of those jobs was, it was lieutenant governor. He picked you or selected you while you were Senate minority leader. And for those, uh, for those who don't know uh, New York politics, that's a, that's a lonely position to be in, right? The uh, Senate uh, minority leader. Senate majority leader is a great thing to be. Senate minority leader is not so great. It's very difficult to maneuver. Would you say? Uh, absolutely. As minority leader, uh, we were down seven seats as Democrats to the Republicans, and I had won back five of them. So now, two seats away from becoming the majority leader, people thought I had lost my mind when I chose to become uh, his lieutenant governor, because I think everybody thought he was going to win. So I think I had a uh, reasonable expectation that, that I would become lieutenant governor. And the reason I did it was that I thought that my Republican colleagues had figured out how I was beating them. And um, uh, the way I would beat them is I didn't run too many races. I would only run in the districts I thought I could win. It wasn't particularly popular until we were winning. But now I knew that I didn't have the money to go against them. So when Spitzer said he would help me with the Senate campaigns, then we had a deal. In a sense, I traded myself to the Spitzer team uh, to enable the team I was on to be in the majority in, 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 in the Senate. That was why I did it. The other part, becoming governor, that I did not factor that into the equation. I was going to say that I spoke to you shortly after being, uh, being selected to run for, or I should say nominated to run for uh, lieutenant governor, and, uh, you know, it was something I thought you had some trepidation about, and uh, you, you decided to do it. But you decided to do it when Governor Spitzer, or, or then Attorney General Spitzer, told you, look, you're going you're gonna to be an active part of this. You're not just going to be, you know, a, a side guy. You're going to be an active part of that. Did he keep up his bargain on that? He definitely kept his word. He uh, allowed me to direct energy policy, pretty much, for the state. I was in on all the, uh, the budget meetings. Uh, minority and women business uh, enterprises. I was trying to get them a fair shake in the state. They didn't have one. Uh, domestic violence issues were important to me. And um, arts and culture were important to me. So, uh, and uh, we wanted to create money for stem cell research. And he, he let me uh, run that area. I mean, the governor is always the governor. And uh, as lieutenant governor, you work for the governor. You just have to get that. Uh, one of the reasons I think that the governor selected me is he interviewed other people and he said, can you be loyal to me? And they'd say, well, I'm a team player, but uh, when something's in my heart, I have to stand up for my principles. You might as well walk right out the door when you say something like that. And I think he knew that I understood the, the value of, of loyalty and, and I think in addition to uh, our effort to take over the Senate, uh, I, I think that's why he selected me. Uh, I, I think my dream was to be United States Senator from New York. It's very interesting about dreams. Sometimes when they can't come true, you actually can't fulfill them. Because I had a chance to appoint myself to the United States Senate, but I knew that if I did, there'd be a fight as to who would become governor, because the Senate, which is where the next uh, person in line that would serve as governor, was so divided, I knew it would be a big fight. And actually, I, it was proven later on, because they did have a big fight. And to solve that problem, I appointed a lieutenant governor. Um, and it was sustained by the courts, which uh, everyone said would not happen. But uh, I actually was sitting there and could have appointed myself to the United States Senate, which was sort of my dream. But I also knew it would have been the wrong thing to do. And uh, if I had, I would have, and the state would have regretted it. 
on that note, we're going to take a break, but I do want to talk to you about that and, and ask you if, uh, if you had any thoughts, after thoughts on that. We'll be back with Governor David Patterson. When the scandal broke, when I, the, the Spitzer sex scandal uh, with the prostitutes, when that broke, first of all, what was your initial reaction? And then secondly, did you expect him to resign? The Turning Point is brought to you by Smith DeGroat Real Estate, serving the tri-state area since 1955, and CAI, insurance solutions since 1961, on the web at www.conferenceny.com. Turning Point with Frank McKay is brought to you by Atlantic Honda, New York's auto giant, and Herman Katz, Can Jimmy and Klein, property tax attorneys and advisors. Welcome back. Our guest again is... David Patterson, former governor of New York. Governor, before the break, we spoke about the possibility or the ability to appoint yourself to U.S. Senate, which, by the way, is a, a great job, right? You run every six years once you get there. But this would have been to fulfill the unexpired term of Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. Am I right? Correct. Okay. How much time did you give to actually consider putting yourself in that position? Well, I had a, an assistant, uh, John Cohen, who was from Long Island, of course, and he researched it, and he informed me that in the last 10 uh, appointments where a governor appointed themselves to, this, to the Senate, nine of them were beaten <laughs> the next time there was a race. The only one who won was in 1938 in the state of Kentucky, and the governor's name was Happy Chandler. No kidding. The old baseball commissioner. Yeah. So I figured, you know, with a 10% chance of staying, maybe I'll just stay right where I am. And, of course, the, the major reason was one I mentioned before. I did not think the state could be run um, by constant fighting over who was the governor because the Senate was split, Republican and Democrat. And I thought they would just swing back and forth week to week and it would be chaos blamed on me. Well, do a hypothetical. What would have happened? What would have happened if you would have... Well, what happened since there was no lieutenant governor, the majority leader of the Senate becomes the acting governor. That would have been Senator Joe Bruno. But uh, at that point, it would have been Senator Malcolm Smith. Oh, right. He was now the majority leader. <clears throat> but he had four members of his conference who had threatened to vote with the Republicans. So if the new minority leader of the Senate, Dean Skelos, who's now the majority leader had <clears throat> he gotten two of those four to switch, he would have been the acting governor. So I figured put those four people in position of being literally kingmakers, and with all that they were extracting from the, the two leaders to, to um, make one of them the majority leader, imagine how chaotic it would have gotten if they were now negotiating over who would be governor. The scenario was possible because of the, the resignation of, of Spitzer, of Elliot Correct. Spitzer. When the scandal broke, when I, the, the Spitzer sex scandal uh, with the prostitutes, when that broke, first of all, what was your initial reaction? And then secondly, did you expect him to resign? Well, my reaction was stunned disbelief for the first, I'd say, 10 minutes, like everyone else. Yeah. Uh, I think I knew at that point that he had to resign. So what I wanted to do was to get completely out of the story. And I went to leave the uh, Capitol, and I opened the door to my office, and 15 cameras went off in my face. And I closed the door, and I turned to my secretary and said, I think my life just changed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You didn't have 15 cameras before that, that's for sure. No, when you're lieutenant governor, nobody really cares what you do. <laughs> yeah. And uh, your basic job is to call the governor every day in the morning, and if he answers, your work is done. <laughs> right. But you didn't expect to be governor when you took the lieutenant governor's spot, right? Never. Never. I went to the National Lieutenant Governors Association. Frank, did you know there was a National Lieutenant Governors Association? No, I had no idea. <clears throat> you know what they do? What? They sit around and talk about all sort of morbid things like plane crashes. <laughs> and we, have, we would have seminars on... Um, how to put sugar in someone's car engine, oh. and uh, how to perf perfect the fake Heimlich maneuver. Yeah. 
<laughs> like the governor's on the floor. Oh, oh, governor. <laughs> so uh, that's true, but, right? There's a lot of dark but, humor going on. But that. they had uh, Secretary Kempthorn come in. He had been a governor, and uh, 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 and uh, well, no, when Secretary Kempthorn became governor, the person who succeeded him came in. He was a governor, and he was saying, "Look, you guys, I know you don't think it can ever happen." He said, "But every two years, a." Governor is replaced, and of course, Governor Rowland of Connecticut uh, was indicted, and therefore Jody Rell became the governor, and and of course, Governor McGreevy resigned, making uh, Senator Cody the governor in New Jersey. So it can happen, and it happens very often. But I still, you know, thought, well, those are the smaller states. It doesn't happen in the larger states. And then uh, I get this phone call one day. The content of it is, uh, next few hours, you're going to be governor. And I was able to ask Governor Spitzer for a few more days before his resignation went into effect to give me time to prepare. But it took Governor Spitzer a year to, he was preparing to be governor as he was running. And uh, even with that, I thought he was just coming into his leadership when he left. It takes a year to kind of get adjusted. And so with no preparation, I thought it took me two years. It was only in my last year that I can honestly say I knew how to run the state. When you became the nominee for lieutenant governor, I think we all felt, you know, people that are watching politics or involved in politics in New York State figured that he was going to win and it was going to be a landslide. Uh, John Faso was the opponent. He didn't have uh, any resources, quite frankly. And Spitzer had a big name and, you know, you, you added to that. And it was a, it was a landslide. Were you thinking, I'll be lieutenant governor for a couple of years, then he'll go on and Spitzer will run for president, and then I'll run for governor? I mean, is that what you were thinking? No, I was thinking that uh, Hillary Clinton was going to be president, and I thought that I had a chance that the governor, if I did a good job, would appoint me to Hillary Clinton's Senate seat. Yeah, right. That's, oh, that's interesting. Was that discussed before you took the spot? Well, I knew that I couldn't make that a condition. But I just expressed to the governor that I was interested. He has since said that he would have appointed me to the Senate seat. And if you think about it, logically, it makes sense. If you appoint your lieutenant governor, everyone's mad that you didn't pick them. But they figure, well, you know, that's his guy. You know, they, right. of course he would take him. But if he takes anyone other than me, now it's like, well, if he wasn't going to take the lieutenant governor, well, then who, why didn't he take me? And that was one of the problems I had. You know, whenever you make a selection, you make 20 enemies. That's for sure. And there were a lot of people not happy that they weren't selected. Yeah, no, no question about that. We're going to come back and we're going to talk more with Governor David Patterson. But it put me in a place where I noticed that every time someone had a problem with me over legitimate issues, like me trying to cut spending when the state's about to uh, go into uh, bankruptcy, default, uh, insolvency, that they would bring up these issues. Turning Point is brought to you by PC Wealth Management of Morgan Stanley Smith Barney and the law firm of Duffy & Duffy, protecting the victims of medical error. And we're back with former Governor David Patterson. Governor, the second you took office, governor, for, for governor, scandals everywhere. The Spitzer situation came up. You, I, I think you disclosed some information. You made a decision to disclose some information, and they kind of beat you up on that. The one thing I want to talk to you about are these Yankee tickets, right? <laughs> you, you went to the Yankees World Series game, and, and for the life of me, I can't understand this. You went to the Yankees World Series game, and you ended up paying a $61,000 fine. Just give us a little background on this. Well, my counsel wrote a letter to the Yankees saying that uh, the governor would like to come to the World Series, just the governor. And um, that letter never appeared in the Public Integrity Commission's report. They made it appear that we didn't give any notice at all and just came to the game and demanded to be let in. And um, I think the Public Integrity Commission was the non-public, no-integrity commission because the way, the way they handled the situation was completely uh, negligent. 
And remember, this is the same Public Integrity Commission that leaked information about the Troopergate investigation. This was the police following Joe Bruno. And they leaked this information. The Inspector General wanted to indict three of them and get rid of the whole, I mean, subpoena the whole board. And at that point, there was so much chaos going on in the state, I said, no, what we'll do is we'll just ask them all to resign. When I asked them to resign, they refused to resign, and I knew in that moment that if anything ever came up, they would take full advantage of it. So uh, I wound up paying a $61,000 fine for going to the Yankee game uh, uh, and not paying for the tickets. I thought, I thought that you're, you're supposed to be there. You're the governor. The Yankees are New York. I mean, this is a New York team. Bring a, they bring a lot of revenue in. They bring in a lot of attention to the state. I would have been angry if you didn't show up to the game. I had no idea you pay for tickets or you don't pay for tickets. The governor of the state of New York is supposed to pay for Yankee tickets for the World Series. It should be there. It should be almost mandatory that you're at a game like that. And, you know, when the governor goes to things, you still need a press secretary and uh, you need security and you need people to help you with things. This is part of, of being governor. And, uh, and then I committed a cardinal sin. I brought my son to see the World Series. Yeah, with. unbelievable. Yeah, but that's, I, I mean, obviously there was a setup. I, I was going to ask you, who do you think set you up? But I, I think that it's clear, right? It's clear what happened. What was interesting was that the whatever they call themselves, Public Integrity Commission, released a report before they'd finished writing it because they had thought that because of another accusation, I was going to resign, and they just wanted to be in the story. They wanted to make it appear that they had thrown me out of office. Guess what? Now they're out of office. <laughs> did, did you ever discuss resigning or ever consider resigning? No, because I hadn't done anything wrong. And uh, I did uh, choose not to run for re-election because I knew I couldn't defend myself, govern the state, and run for office at the same time. But I would never resign. And a lot of people told me that I should, and there were all these predictions that I would, and uh, people trumped up uh, accusations against me. Uh, the, only other, the only thing that ever happened to me was I had to pay a fine, which I could have appealed, but I didn't because it would have cost me more money in legal bills to pay the lawyers than it would to have paid the fine. Yeah, I mean, that's... That's the case, right? It would have cost you a fortune. And you're not a, yeah. you're not a rich guy. You're not loaded. Uh, no, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> and you say that with no, uh, no shame. I mean, you, 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 know, you work for your money, that's for sure. Well, I, I think that um, the legislature, the new governor, uh, the new heads of these good government groups have done an excellent job really reversing the political nature of the good government process. Um, uh, people doing contracts. One of the good government group heads had to resign themselves when the legislature passed a law that the good government groups have to disclose who is donating to them because they were doing deals. Corrupt people. And one thing about being corrupt, it's one thing when you're just an elected official, it's corrupt, but when you're calling yourself good government and you are that um, dishonest, uh, I, I think it was an absolute shame, but I must say the new administration and a lot of the uh, very effective good government people have cleaned up that process, and I don't think it'll happen to anyone else in the near future.